In this lesson, we're going to talk about retrosynthesis, which is basically synthesis in reverse. We know a target that we wish to make, and we need to go backwards and think about how we'll make it from things we can buy. So we'll start with a pretty simple molecule to introduce some terminology and some concepts. This is our target molecule. And we want to think about how to make this from commercially available chemicals. And so we're going to use an arrow that allows us to show that we're thinking in reverse. This is the retrosynthetic arrow or retrosynthesis arrow. So here's our arrow, and we want to think about breaking a bond. For this example, I'm going to cleave this bond next to the ether. So I've drawn a little wavy line to show that. This line is called a disconnection. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw each side of the molecule without thinking about the reagent or chemical we're going to use. We're just going to break this bond and draw what we get. Now we need to think about the polarity that each of these partners will have, assuming that we have a polar reaction that's going to happen to form this. And we're forming an ether, and you might remember there's the Williamson etherification reaction that allows us to form ethers. Well, first of all, I'm going to assign polarity, but I'm going to do it in the wrong way, just to show you, and then we'll, we'll do it the correct way. Now, say I thought this had to be nucleophilic. I would draw this, which is called a synthon, with a negative charge here. So now, if this is negative, well, this would have to be positive. Now, this kind of polarity on these molecules, which, which are synthons, these are idealized reagents to just show what would be a nucleophile and what would be an electrophile. They might correspond to an intermediate along the path, but they're not real reagents. But these aren't very good. Look at oxygen. We have a positive charge on it. We think of oxygen typically as a nucleophile. The lone pairs on oxygen attack things. And here, we'd have to have some sort of Grignard with another bromine in it. This is not the natural polarity that this type of reaction would take on. So if we did this and set this up as our th synthons, we should notice that oxygen being positive and getting attacked, that doesn't really happen. Let's redraw them with the correct polarity. Here are our correctly drawn synthons. The oxygen has negative charge. This is natural. Oxygen tends to have negative charge. And this more electropositive carbon has positive character in our synthons. The nucleophilic partner, this one, is going to be called our donor synthon. It donates the electrons. And this one will be the acceptor. All right, now I can't go to Sigma Aldrich and find synthons. I just can't buy these things. I need to buy reagents. So what could this translate to? Well, this one is pretty easy. It has an O minus, but we know that phenols are pretty readily available, maybe from our electrophilic aromatic substitution chapters. So here's phenol. And then something like this would need to have a leaving group on it. So to have carbon to have positive character, something that's uh, inductively electron withdrawing will give that positive character. And if the leaving group leaves, we form a carbocation. Of course, this is a primary carbocation. But remember, this is a synthon. This is just a device to help us think about what we need to put together. So maybe we could have just a bromide on this side as well. And one of the bromides will leave in our reaction. Our reagent will be this, 1,2-dibromoethane here. In this example, I told you we wanted to cleave this bond. This is a pretty good rule, cleaving next to a heteroatom. So if we can cut a bond and think about a reasonable reaction that we know from all of our organic chemistry to make this bond in ether linkage, that's great. But there are a couple places that are next to these heteroatoms that I didn't cleave, and I want to show you why before we move on to lots of reactions and examples. Here's our target molecule redrawn. Now I'm going to draw some other disconnections. We'll cleave on the left side of the ether and call this A, and then we'll disconnect adjacent to the bromide and call that B. Okay, neither of these is a very good disconnection, so why not? With A, if we're capitalizing on the natural polarity of oxygen to be negative and a nucleophile, we're going to end up with an aryl cation. Let's draw our synthons. Now, this aryl cation might look familiar from the diazonium reaction. So these can be formed, but they're really high energy, and this is kind of a difficult reaction. 
This isn't the natural polarity of an aromatic ring. Now, if we had electron withdrawing groups on here, we could think of maybe a nucleophilic aromatic substitution involving a positively charged area on an aromatic ring. But for this unsubstituted ring, that doesn't really apply. So there's no reason we do nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Doing a diazonium reaction is not as reliable as the Williamson etherification. So that's why A would not be our best disconnection. Okay, why not B? All right, so we just broke the bond. We haven't put on our polarities yet, but bromine usually has a negative charge. Br minus is a good leaving group, a good nucleophile. So let's assign that polarity to this synthon. Now we need a positive charge here. Okay, well, we saw we could do that. Carbon is an electropositive atom, and we came up with something like this. So... Why would we put a leaving group on a carbon just to replace it with another group? That doesn't simplify our synthesis at all. We already need to have all of this built up if we were adding on the bromine in a last step. So this doesn't make sense either. So our best disconnection is cleaving here to the right of the heteroatom and using the negative charge of oxygen in perhaps a Williamson ether synthesis. Now we can draw a forward synthesis Beginning with phenol, we can treat this with base, perhaps sodium hydride, and then add in our bromide, and this should give our target molecule. This analysis is going to work for sulfur too, so let's make this compound very similar to this one. We'll disconnect in the same place, and now I want to introduce a little terminology that we can write above the arrow. We can tell what bond we're cleaving, and here it's a carbon-sulfur bond, so we write CS like this. Up here, we can write CO, and sometimes we'll put the functional group name as well. So CO and making an ether, CS, I could put thioether. Sulfur is a good nucleophile in SN2 reactions, so that has the negative charge. We have the same bromide, and so let's show what reagents we might be able to use. These are both commercially available compounds. We have the sodium salt of this... Um, thiophenol here, so this is an S minus Na plus. You can buy it as the salt from Sigma Aldrich. And it's useful, there's a web page you can go to, the Sigma Aldrich Structure Search, which allows you to put in a structure and search um, for similar structures or that exact structure and see if you've gotten your synthesis back to commercially available compounds. Let's try an example with an amine and see if it'll work out the same. Although this is a pretty simple looking molecule, it is not commercially available. And so you might think, oh, I could probably substitute this amine for maybe a leaving group, maybe a halogen. So that would be a different transformation. We're not really breaking a bond, we're just changing a functional group. So let's introduce another bit of terminology. We're going to write FG over the arrow to show this would be a functional group conversion. Now the corresponding bromide is commercially available. And we might think about reacting this with ammonia. But this reaction has a big problem. Once we alkylate, we add nitrogen in and get that onto the molecule forming this product. This product is actually more nucleophilic than ammonia. There is an added electron density, so there's this inductive electron donating effect from the alkyl group. So this compound is more likely to react with another molecule of bromide than ammonia is to react with it. So you can see the problem will get more than one group on here and we can't really control that. So for amines, this is not a viable route due to overalkylation. But we have a couple solutions for this. The first solution is a reaction called reductive amination. This is where we take the corresponding carbonyl compound, which in this case is this aldehyde, react it with ammonia, and we'll get an imine. This is not typically isolated, but it's reduced with sodium borohydride or hydrogenation, and that will form our target amine. The second solution to the overalkylation problem is to make the amide and then reduce that. Amides are formed very smoothly by the reaction of an amine with an acid chloride and this can be treated with lithium aluminum hydride to form our target molecule. Now this acid chloride is actually not commercially available, but I looked it up and the acid is, so just with the OH here. 
we know that we can treat carboxylic acids with thionyl chloride and form the acid chloride smoothly. So we have a route to this. KP here. If you learned something, give me a thumbs up on the way out. And for more chemistry, subscribe to my channel.